Good morning, and welcome to worship here online with First Presbyterian Church of Fullerton. Today is September 27th, 2020, and we're glad that you're here. Come to join God's people as we celebrate His goodness and seek His guidance for our lives in His Word. I'm Jeff Bridgman, and on behalf of the whole staff, thanks for being with us today. A couple of announcements for you. First of all is that we continue to recruit for our small groups. That is, if you'd like to be in a small group, if you'd like to get to know some people a little bit better and spend time in God's Word and discovering uh, with a group of people who will know you and pray for you and associate with you, then uh, you can do that by contacting Bryn Kernahan. And Bryn's email address is here on the screen, so you can contact her at Bryn D at msn.com, and she'd be happy to connect you. Secondly, uh, and this is kind of interesting, this is really the last uh, digital worship service from my house, from my home office. You see, beginning next week, October 10th, we're going to start in-person worship at 9.30 on the patio at the church. I'm going to invite you to join us uh, but because seating is limited, you're going to need to know that not everyone who wants to come can come. So you need to make a reservation. You can go online and to our reservation portal online, or you can contact our director of church operations, Amy Watson, and she'll sign you up. If you can't get online, there will still be worship. You will see it live streamed at 930 and then after that, any time after that, it will be recorded on the YouTube website so you can follow along, so you can worship whatever your particular situation is on Sunday. We're excited to be moving in this direction. Thank you for coming into my home, for being in my office, for letting me have these conversations with you. May God bless you and bless us all as we begin to open up our life together again. And finally, uh, I was just reading an article that told us that the Queen of England is going to have to cut back on what she does at Windsor Palace and all the other palaces because there's been a lack of income due to uh, tourists not being able to get there. No tourists could come. They can't pay the fee. You don't have all that money. Well, everywhere, even the Queen of England, even the church is wrestling with what do finances look in the year to come. I want you to pray about that, but I, there are things you can do right now. Uh, we've, all ma we've made all kinds of cuts this year because we're not doing some of the things we normally do. But because we're not doing some of those things, our income is down this year. So I want to ask you to seek prayerfully to try and fulfill the commitment you made at the beginning of the year in your tithe and your offering to the church. Now, we all have suffered a loss of income in one fashion or another. Uh, so I understand it might not be possible, but if you would prayerfully consider just giving what you have felt God was leading you to give at the beginning of the year, I believe COVID was not a surprise to God. So our response needs to reflect our faith and our trust in God. So let me invite you to prayerfully consider giving your tithe in the rest of this year. You will be blessed too. Right now, we want to quiet our hearts as we prepare for worship. Will you join me in our call to worship? Praise the Lord, you angels. Praise the Lord's glory and power. Praise the Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord because he is holy. The Lord will be king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Let's sing our praises to God. Keep this flame alive In the fading light When night is breaking I know you will always be waiting You'll always be there You 
were my only hope You are the rock on which I stand You will not let me go I know that I am safe inside your hands and The fading light when night is breaking I know you will always be waiting You will always be there I'm running to the secret place where you are Where you are I sing to you of all the ways you stole my heart Stole my heart Better is the moment that I spend with you Than a million other days away
Will you join me in prayer? Lord God, we come to your word this morning with anticipation, for it is your word to our hearts and you love us so. Give us open hearts and minds. May your spirit uh, be attentive as we are filled up with your word and then as we are poured out to be your love, to be your grace, and now to be your peace in the world around us. Lord, meet us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you realize it was just a little over two weeks ago that the, we celebrated or remembered the ninth anniversary of the 9-11 tragedy. And we realize there's still no peace in Afghanistan or in Iraq. All across the globe, we continually hear about conflict, about uprisings, about insurgencies, about dictatorial crackdowns and religious persecutions, even genocide happening over and over and over again. And of course, the superpowers seem to rattle their sabers at each other and threaten, while the smaller countries cower underneath that threat, knowing that they are the ones who are going to suffer if blows come. And in the end, people flee. 79.5 million people are refugees, displaced from their homes due to the conflicts going on there, the violence, whether it's political, whether it's cartel, whatever the violence is, they can't stay there. It's no longer safe. And so they have to flee their homes. It's hard to imagine what it would be like, but they have to flee their homes with what little they have. The result is that there are approximately 135 countries who are now struggling to know, how do I care for these people from somewhere else? They're trying to escape death and violence. How do they find life in my country? Wow, peace is hard to come by in our world. And even for us, if we think, oh, that's far away, it really doesn't affect me, Still, haven't you found your peace shattered in these last months? Shattered by the unrest of our society? Shattered by the fear of becoming a victim to a pandemic? Maybe shattered by loss of job or loss of relationships, loss of housing, and the isolation that we all had to endure. Where's your peace come from? Today we're returning to Jeremiah 29, that letter that the prophet wrote to the exiled community of God as they suffered and struggled in Babylon. They too had really only a fragile hold on any kind of peace. They'd gone from, from being the definers and uh, designers of the community of their society to folks who now inhabited the margins of another one. Once they were the majority, now they're the minority. And their unique identity as people is disappearing as they're threatened, as they're mixed in with all kinds of other conquered people who have been brought back and are being absorbed by the Babylonian society. And God's word to them was not to isolate or to spend time trying to get back what you'd had. Instead, it was to forge a place in this strange new world. Remember, it said, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce. They were to put down their roots because in God's plan, they were going to be there for a while. Interesting, God didn't say, abandon who you were as my people or give up your distinctive qualities. No, that's they're still to retain that. This is more like, you know what? Don't hide out. You are here for a reason. Who you are and what you are is important to this situation. Be that person, that, that people of faith, in and for the wholeness of your captors. Because you're missionaries now, not victims. So last week, we saw that this is God's calling on us too as the people of God in this time and the place even when we don't find peace all around us. We're still to be his unique people in the world. One of the ways we do that, he says, is to pray, to pray for the world. We're going to look at verse 7 again to see just what we're to pray for. Verse 7, Jeremiah 29. Also, 
Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Interesting. What does it mean to pray that our cities, our communities would prosper? The meaning here for to prosper isn't to go make a killing, to be financially successful, to be leaders in the marketplace, or to to pad up your bank account. Interesting, there is just one Hebrew word here used for both peace and prosperity in all three places in this simple verse. It's the word shalom. You've probably heard that before. It's what we generally translate as peace, but here there is a much larger sense than don't be in conflict. The people are to seek the shalom of the city to which they've been carried in exile. They are to pray to the Lord for it because as it has shalom, they too will have shalom. It's tied together. Very interesting. So we're to pray for shalom. God's people are to be the promoters and investors of this peace and prosperity, of this shalom, right where they are, even if they don't sense there's any peace around them. So what would that mean? Well, in general, we can see that it means praying for the well-being of life and the leadership in that whole community. If you're the low person on the show, on the social totem pole and things aren't going right, the higher-ups are are going to get disturbed, and guess who's going to suffer? It's going to be you. So we pray for those at the top as well as those on the bottom. But this is not God saying pray for the city as a means of preserving yourself. Peace can mean the absence of conflict or the balance of influences so that no one's rocking the boat. And in our society, we find that peace is often won. We say they've won the peace. They've negotiated peace. They deserve that peace. Peace is always valued. It's the ideal we all strive for in relationships with everybody. But all too often, we as a whole, or more often, I think, as individuals, have to settle for partial peace or, or temporary peace. We usually had to have a, make a compromise to come up with that, but we never know how long it will last. Well, That's secular peace. God's peace is different. It's not dependent on exterior situations or agreements between conflicted parties. God's shalom can be known and sought for others even in the most dire situations. You know, I pray for the refugees from Camp Moria in Greece, uh, for they have no peace. They have nowhere to go. They're getting some help, but... 14,000 people on the street, it's a dire situation. Jesus told his disciples in John 14, just as they're reeling from his news of his impending betrayal and death, that there was peace for them. But it was different than what they had known before. Peace I leave with you, Jesus said. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Well, shalom doesn't mean we won't be troubled or we won't be afraid, but that what God gives us will actually define us, not our circumstances, not the exterior, and it makes us greater, stronger, enabled in our situation. You know, for 20 years, I pastored the San Inez Valley Presbyterian Church just outside of Solvang, California, up near Santa Barbara. I'll never forget the time we went back to visit and one of the pillars of the church, a very important person in me coming to the church as well as being, being supported all those years was in a difficult way. Jake was an old Dutch dairyman, strong, self-sufficient, but he was a man of deep faith. And at 85 years old, he'd suffered a fall. He was dealing with deepening dementia 
an assortment of ills that had got him down. He was now bedridden. He was on hospice. So we visited Jake for the last time. And while we were there, his mind would come and go. He'd recall things 50 years ago, but then he couldn't remember what day it was. And while his wife sat there and quietly cried during our visit, I became his pastor again. And I began to read scripture. Scripture I knew that he had learned as a boy in that Dutch Reformed church. I read the 23rd Psalm. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And as I read, Jake looked straight at me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And no sooner had I finished, Jake said, No fear, I am not afraid. Jake had shalom. You see, shalom was rooted in his relationship with God. So in the midst of all the things that were failing in his life, Jake had peace, and it came from the one who truly mattered. Remember the Paul, Apostle Paul told us in Philippians to have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we're to let our requests be made known to God and the peace, the shalom of God which transcends all understanding will make your hearts and will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peace comes out of that relationship with God and peace keeps us in it. He's not only the one who gives us peace, but God is the very foundation of our peace. Through him is the source of shalom and people just can't do that. In the great prophecies of Isaiah 9, where God is describing the coming Messiah for this scattered and exiled people, we read those great titles. We usually sing them at Christmas in the Messiah, but they are titles which are fulfilled in Jesus, that he will be wonderful counselor. He will be mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. Shalom. God's peace is embodied in the very being of Jesus, who becomes our peace ruler. He, he's overcome death. He's defeated the spiritual enemies who want to capture and confine us. We can have peace. This shalom gives us hope and assurance because we have a wholeness with God in the very face of all manner of spiritual attack. Attack. Our prince has won, giving us confidence and that nothing will change. It's a relationship now that can't be broken. Shalom is his gift, and he gives it to us through the Holy Spirit. Peace is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Do you have the fruit of peace in your life? Do you want it? It begins and ends in Jesus. You know, the Hebrew root for shalom means wholeness or perfection. Well, that means that reaching the goal of our, it's reaching the goal of our faith that God has set for us. That's the, that's the wholeness. That's the perfection. Living in shalom is really a lifetime journey. In spite of his failing health, my friend Jake was still being perfected until the day when he want to, went to be with the Lord face to face. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have a relationship with God through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jake had it. Do you? Because shalom means to be whole with God in every part of your life, from our physical health to our mental health to our social health, even our financial health. You know, Jake and his wife were some of the most generous people that church ever knew. There's so many things got done, so many things were paid for because they had shalom. 
And that humble couple found peace in freely giving their resources to the work of Christ's church. And that's perhaps the greatest test of our faith at all, to let God shalom into that area where we are most challenged and maybe where we are the most reticent to let go. There's a story in Luke 18, it's called The Rich Young Ruler, so guess what it's about? God, he had let every, God have every part of his life except money, which interestingly seems to define him as a rich young ruler. And so when Jesus challenged him, said, you need to let go of that, he couldn't. He couldn't let God have that one thing. And he left without the peace that Jesus offers. Now that doesn't mean in our struggles, as we seek to let go to God, they'll suddenly be over. Our bodies will be healed. Our bank accounts will be balanced. Shalom's not a magic spell. It's an interior reality, a foundation for living with those things. And in them, we discover peace no matter what our condition is. So what part of your life is not being shaped by God's shalom? Why not? In it, we, we discover that there is a God who cares about every part that makes us whole as people. Not just our church attendance, not just our offering, not just our Bible study. This shalom says God cares about everything about who you are. You're a man, you're a woman, God knows he cares. The color of your skin, God knows he cares. Your gifts, your abilities, your inabilities, God knows he cares. His peace will not leave you. No problem is too small, no problem is too great for God to hear about it, to care about it, to be present with you in it. So why? Why do we hold out on God? Where is peace needed in your life this morning? Have you prayed about it? Have you entrusted it to God? I know how that goes. Oh God, I'm giving you this, but I'm going to take it back because I really want it to go my way. Can you say you've really let it go to his purposes? It's not easy. And that's why these exiles were being challenged to uh, do what they were being challenged to do in their shalom is to let go of everything and rely on that relationship with God to define them, to trust God for their wholeness, for their homes, for their food to eat, for the future, for their families, their children, their grandchildren, because none of that was in their control. Then they would become living witnesses of God's peace, of his fellowship, his wholeness, his healing his security, his prosperity, his faith, and the community in the community of Babylon. How about in our Babylons, the community we live in, the mission field God's placed us in? What are people seeing in you and me? You know, Jeremiah told the people that they were to pray for the shalom of that place where they were. It wasn't to be achieved by isolating themselves, but by engaging God's love with the needs of other people. So when the news disgusts you, turn it off, not to avoid it, but to do something about it, to pray. When you've got that disturbed sense uh, inside of you, you know something's not quite right, that just might be God telling you, it's time for you to act. It's time for you to pray for shalom right there in that situation. That's what we're supposed to pray for. And that's what I want us to do right now. Right now, I want you to put away everything, anything that's a distraction to you, your coffee cup, whatever's going on, whatever you're doing, and, and stop. And close your eyes because we're going to pray. You ready? All right, God, we open our hearts and minds to you. Now in your mind, picture your city. What comes to mind when you say to yourself, I live in Fullerton, La Habra, Brea, Anaheim, Orange, wherever you live. Is it a person, a group of people, 
Is it a place? Maybe an event? Hold on to whatever comes to mind. Now, give thanks for that thing, that person, that city, those people. As we read in the Philippians text, one of the key things for praying is that instead of being anxious or worried about those things, we pray with thanksgiving. Certainly, there's something in that image, that place, that person, for which you can be grateful. Lord, thank you for creating our city. Thank you for the positive life-giving parts of it. We give you praise and thanksgiving for where we live. Thank you for the people who make it work. The police department, the fire department, the city workers, those who govern, those who work behind the scenes. Thank you, God. And Lord, we give you thanks for those who want to make it better for those who bring a growing awareness to what better could be. Thank you, God. Maybe God's given you a picture of someone who's in need. Give thanks for them. Give thanks for their life. Give thanks that somehow your lives have intersected. Give thanks for the provisions God has brought to them. They are his creation. Pray for their peace and prosperity. Now, pray for the shalom of that person. Pray for their peace with God, with God and their wholeness with God. Pray that God might draw them to his heart. Draw this city to his heart, this school, this class. Pray that those who don't have enough today will find sufficiency in a meal provided. Pray for those who have too much that they will give the things they have to their city. Pray for the churches, that shalom might be found in them, and that shalom might be an increasing witness through them. Pray that people who are disturbed could encounter the Lord's peace. And while that might not make sense, they would know an assurance in their distress and encounter the demonstration of God's love clearly. Pray. And now pray for yourself. Ask the Lord to be your peace, to give you shalom in those parts of your life where there is no peace. Pray that God will show you how to be a peacemaker. For Paul said, as far as it's up to you, live at peace with one another. With whom do you need to be at peace today? How can you let God's shalom be more in your life, more than just a word or a wishful thought? Ask God what you need to do and do it. Pray to be God's peace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Gracious God, we praise and thank you for your loving care of us. We are in awe of your power and majesty. Thank you for our beautiful world that you have created. We pray that you will guide us in being wise caretakers of it. We lift our prayers to you for our nation and for those who govern it. May your wisdom guide us as we come nearer to the November elections. 
May we as a country join in community rather than in division. Loving Lord, you are the great physician, and we lift our prayers for all who are struggling with the effects of the coronavirus, other illnesses, or physical hardships. May your healing love be felt by each. We rejoice that Clem St. Louis is at home and recovering. Please continue his restoration to good health. As the pandemic continues, we lift those to you who are feeling lonely, isolated, depressed, or hopeless. Please restore within each your hope that will revive and refresh each anew. We thank you for the hardworking doctors, nurses, and other care providers who serve the ill. We are also thankful for the essential workers who have risked illness to service in our grave grocery stores, drug stores, fast food, and restaurants and local businesses. We pray for their safety and continuing good health. We thank you for the children, their pillar parents, the teachers and administrators who are adjusting to the online schooling that's taking place during the pandemic. We are grateful for the preschool and the on-campus activities here at Fullerton Press. We pray for the teachers, parents, and supportive congregation members who are overseeing these programs. We're so grateful for Pastor Jeff and his ministry with us and for our helpful, caring staff. We lift our prayers to you for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Please provide them with comfort and your boundless love as they grieve. Sovereign Lord, please hear our silent prayers for those we now name who are in need of you. As many protests continue across our country, we pray for the safety of the communities involved, for those demonstrating and for those who are protecting the communities affected. We pray for an end to the violence and that your forgiveness and reconciliation will take its place. We pray that your mighty hand will put an end to the hostility and that community will replace divisiveness. As the fires continue to rage in the West, we pray for the safety of those who are responding and to th those who need the protection of their properties. We look to you, merciful God, to be with all of those who have been deluged with rain, hurricanes, tornadoes, and flooding. Please take care of the needs of the many who have been displaced by the storms and soothe their hurting hearts. We are so grateful for your faithfulness to each of us every single day. Please join our voices now in the prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So will you join me now in our benediction? Reach out if there's someone near you, grab a hand, lift your hands up. We're blessing the church, all God's people, shall we? And now go and bless the world. And remember, you go nowhere by accident. Where you are going, God is sending you. And where you are, he has placed you. God has a purpose for your life right where you are. Christ Jesus, who indwells you, has something that he wants to do in and through your life right where you are. Believe this and go in his love and in his grace and in his power. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you live streaming next Sunday. Go in his peace.